Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for a webinar hosted by the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, we're looking forward to an inspiring discussion today um, where we'll be talking about energy solutions that RMI and a broad network of partners around the world are developing, developing to bring a clean, prosperous energy future to all. And obviously it's always worth noting that none of this transformative work could happen without you, our supporters. So we are so very grateful, especially in this very challenging and tumultuous year um, for your support and commitment to forging a clean energy future. So we have RMI's uh, Chief Executive Officer, Jules Cortenhorst today, and he will be sharing some exciting updates from across the Institute about our new global programs and how we've realigned our portfolio of work to meet the demands necessary for keeping temperature rise below one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, after Jules' presentation, short presentation, Jules would then talk with some, what we like to call rising stars, emerging stars within the Institute about their work and the impacts that, that it's making. After their discussion, we'll have about 20 minutes at the end to answer questions from our audience. Um, you can submit your questions anytime during the conversation uh, by entering them into the chat function on your control panel. We'll get to try and get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion. Um, and as always, a recording of today's discussion will be sent to all of you following um, the close of the event. So I will now turn it over to Jules. Thank you, Audrey, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And let me start by a, expressing a warm welcome to all of you for, for joining us on this critically important conversation about the energy transition. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to get you inspired about the progress that we are making in accelerating the transition to a low carbon uh, and, and prosperous energy future. And, also a very warm welcome to my three fellow panelists and exciting to see you all here. Um, with us this morning, um, we have Lauren Trischberg, who is a manager in RMI's electricity program. Lauren has already been part of RMI for quite a while and her work focuses on the role that renewable energy and distributed energy resources can play in uh, the grid planning and grid investments. Um, and uh, by way of background, um, Lauren has worked uh, and engaged with cities, federal government agencies in the United States and in Australia with large commercial and industrial customers and with utilities uh, all around the world. She's also experienced as a facilitator, facilitator in RMI's Electricity Innovation Lab or ELAB, which is an assembly of thought leaders and decision makers in our electricity practice. Welcome, Lauren. Uh, then we have Sydney Jules on the line. Uh, Sydney, uh, welcome, great to have you here. Uh, Sydney is a senior associate in our Islands Energy Program, uh, where he has uh, been working on uh, helping drive integrated resource planning and uh, renewable project development on islands across the Caribbean. Uh, these plans are specifically important to define and identify the optimal resources and generation mix that will help individual islands in their transition. Sydney originally hails from the Commonwealth of Dominica, so he is uh, working in his, uh, in his home region. Uh, Dominica is a small island country in the Eastern Caribbean, which unfortunately has been ravaged by hurricanes um, over the recent years. Uh, but Sydney is also a graduate of Yale University um, and uh, earned his master's in environmental management at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies there. And earlier he got his uh, BA and master's in engineering uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, welcome, uh, Sydney. Great to have you here. And finally, Ryan Shi. Uh, Ryan is a senior associate on our city's renewable accelerator team where he works to support and scale uh, city efforts to procure and deploy uh, clean and renewable energy solutions and decarbonize their electricity supply. Um, and uh, he has developed a, a PPA economic calculator. You're gonna have to explain us later on what that precisely is, Ryan, uh, but helping to assess uh, the relative merits of solar and wind. And recently 
at Progress, for example, in the city of Cincinnati that signed up a 100 megawatt off-site solar project on the back of his uh, work. Uh, welcome, Ryan. So what I would like to do first is briefly tell you a little bit about RMI's new strategy. Um, over the course of the last year, we have uh, sat back and, and reviewed the work that we do in the context of the latest climate science. What it really was is that um, we started to realize that when it comes to climate change, winning slowly is the same as losing. Next slide. And um, what that tells us, we'll go to the next slide, is that the impacts of climate change are already with us. The human cost of climate change, as devastating as they are, are already with us. But on the current trajectory, when we are well above two degrees, they will be even worse by the middle of this century. We will have climate migrants all around the world, but particularly in Africa. Rising sea levels, displacing populations, ruining farmlands and destroying infrastructure. We'll see lots of death and destruction as a result of climate damage from 2030 to 2050. And in order to start addressing that, we need to pick up the pace in our work as well. Next slide. So RMI remains dedicated to our mission to transform global energy use to drive a clean, prosperous and secure zero carbon future. But by focusing our work even more specifically on aligning with the one and a half degree goal set by the Paris Agreement, we are making our impact even more tangible. Next slide. And that one and a half degree goal translates really in two aspects, two goals associated with greenhouse gas emissions. First, we all know that we need to be net zero in emissions of greenhouse gases by the middle of the century. That has pretty much always been our goal. That has been a clear um, perspective of RMI uh, from the get-go. But what we also need to do is to reduce CO2 emissions by 50% within the next decade. So by 2030, we already need to be halfway towards that goal of net zero emissions. And that makes our work even more immediate, even more significant, even more tangible. Next slide. So as energy is 70% of the problem, energy also needs to be 70% of the solution. So we've laid out for ourselves what an ambitious pathway to 2030 is. And it starts with clean electricity. We need to make sure that 75% of our electricity system is clean and that by uh, 2030, we can count on 75% of the electrons being low carbon. We also need to increase dramatically the pace of energy productivity improvements. We need to drive energy efficiency so that we not only have clean electrons, but very efficient electrons. The next step then is to use those clean and efficient electrons to drive the electrification of two critical sectors in particular, our buildings and our mobility, our automotive sector. By moving already 50% of the energy used in buildings and cars to clean electrons by the middle of the century, we will significantly improve uh, the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases uh, per energy use. And finally, we need to catalyze the markets, bring to bear the technology, the information systems, uh, towards net zero pathways for the sectors where we use energy that are not able to be electrified. So those are the four goals underlying our program. Next slide. Uh, and all of it is geared towards activating the F-curve, the scaling up of the new energy solutions uh, at a pace that, has rival that rivals the penetration of other new technologies like our mobile phones. Remember, this didn't even exist 12 years ago. And now it is common in all of our lives. Smartphones, we cannot imagine life without it. We similarly need to scale the clean energy solutions over the next 10 years so that we cannot imagine that we live without them uh, in 2030. Next slide. And RMI brings to this decisive decade a 40-year track record of leveraging market-driven change, 
of being integrated energy system thinkers. We always take the sort of whole systems approach. And we try to take a global perspective to the de energy change. We have a track record of building successful market affiliates that drive to scale some of the solutions uh, that, we can, um, that we can bring to the energy transition. For example, we have helped to stand up the largest association of corporates buying clean electricity. And we've spun out a platform for the use of blockchain technology in the electricity system. And we will continue to use market affiliates as a way of driving our solutions to scale. And finally, um, we recognize the important role that everybody has to play in this um, arena. And therefore, um, we, uh, we appreciate and value deep collaboration and coalition building as a mechanism uh, to, to drive our impact. Next slide. So what will we be doing over the next years? Our focus will be on doing two things in five places. First, we will drive the decarbonization of the critical sectors of our energy economy. We'll work on electricity in our Global Center for Electricity System Transformation, scaling up renewables instead of coal and gas. In our carbon-free mobility program, we'll focus on the rollout of electric mobility through charging and EV infrastructure. In our carbon-free buildings program, we will work to make buildings more efficient and stop the use of natural gas in the built environment. So think of the cooking and the heating um, of our buildings. We need to replace the natural gas there with uh, electricity. And finally, in those industry sectors where we don't have all the answers yet, we will work with the industry sectors to create climate-aligned pathways towards net zero, also on the basis of new technologies. Secondly, we will strengthen some of the market catalysts that we know will help to scale these solutions more rapidly. First, together with a number of other organizations, we're building the big data and artificial intelligence infrastructure to provide insight and intelligence to the climate change debate. And we're doing that uh, by pinpointing the greenhouse gas emissions time and location specific, so we really measure what we need to manage. In our Breakthrough Technology Program, we're bringing together an ecosystem of innovative companies, large corporates, and venture capitalists to scale the solutions that we still need to uh, decarbonize our economy. And finally, recognizing that we need to build more capacity for the right energy decision-making in countries around the world we're hoping to stand up an energy transition academy that will train um, energy executives, regulators, policymakers, and investors around the world in the new insights and provide them with the tools necessary to make the right decisions for the energy future. And I'm sure Sydney can talk some more about that uh, later on. And we're doing that in all the critical places around the world. The biggest program for RMI is still our US program but our efforts in China and India, where we have offices on the ground, are growing very rapidly as well. We will continue to work in developing countries such as Africa, Southeast Asia, and small island states. There where governments really rely on our input and our support in making the right decisions on energy. And finally, we'll um, do our work in cities around the world because we see so much of the critical decision making and so much of the ability to execute come together in cities. And Ryan, you can tell us more about that in a moment. So next slide. Um, we, are, we are recognizing that this energy transition also needs to be about a just and equitable transition. We cannot just leave people behind as we move to a clean, energy solution, the clean energy solutions of the future. We need to empower communities through local energy leadership. We need to have solutions that are equitable for people in all parts of society. And we need to bring training to bear so that everybody has a voice. So there's a lot more work that we can do in bringing a just and equitable transition uh, to this problem. Next slide. 
So finally, we want you to be hopeful about this transition. We want you to be optimistic and upbeat. But at the same time, we recognize what Greta Thunberg, the young climate activist, has said. She says, I want you to panic and act as if the house on fire it was on fire, because our planet is on fire and we have our work cut out for us. But we think that with this ambitious strategy, we can make a significant contribution to alleviating the impacts of climate change. So let me now turn to our panelists. And uh, uh, I, uh, I would love each of you three uh, to kick off by telling us a little bit about why you came to RMI, what brought you here, and what is the work that you've been doing over the, the last year and gets you so excited. So Lauren, would you be willing to kick off and, and tell us what gets you out of bed? Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here, Jules. Um, so for me, what really brought me to RMI first was growing up by the ocean and wanting to be a marine scientist. That's where I really started firsthand to see the impacts of climate change. Um, so I was seeing coral reef bleaching, seeing our kelp forest in California becoming bare, and that really inspired me to study engineering and ocean science in college. So after school, I actually went to go build research ships for the US Navy as a civilian engineer. And it was there that I really started to be interested in renewable energy as one of the key climate solutions. And part of that was through really understanding the value of renewable energy uh, to the things that really mattered to the Navy's mission. So energy efficiency and energy resilience um, and how that impacted their ability to carry out the mission. So I, there I really decided that that was the topic on which I wanted to have a career impact. So I went to grad school um, and studied renewable energy systems. And there, I think the thing that was really eye-opening for me is just how interdisciplinary a topic energy is. And I became really passionate about the, the real human element of the energy transition and how we can think about centering equity in the transition. So that's what really attracted me to RMI during grad school is that um, I was offered an internship and the project at hand and the way that RMI was approaching it was really exciting to me. So the project uh, really spoke to this human dynamic component of the work and it was uh, helping the team to stand up a social change lab in New York. And the lab was created to understand basically what would it take to create equitable energy solutions in New York and bringing a group of stakeholders together to, to understand which areas in which we could move forward faster together. So I actually took an effort, a semester off of school to stay at RMI a little bit longer. And as Joel said, I've now been here for a couple of years, uh, just over three years. Um, this past year, what gets me out of bed, I've been working with our Global Center for Electricity Transformation. and. Um, my focus is really on clean energy planning and procurement. Um, so thinking about what changes are needed to how utilities plan and buy new resources, given the scale of decarbonization we need to achieve in the coming decade. So we are um, about to release a report on new procurement practices that I'm really excited about, but really describing what utilities, regulators, state policymakers can do over this next decade to uh, bring on the many new resources that we're going to need. So tons of efficiency, wind, solar, uh, to meet the growing needs from electrification, um, and the ways that we can do that, that, that provide a lot of those benefits that people are seeking. So uh, decarbonization, but also economic development, resilience, customer choice, environmental justice. Um, so that's what gets me out of bed, and that's what brought me to RMI. Thank you, Lauren. And I realized I needed to unmute the most regular observation in the year 2020. Uh, Sydney, I'm going to come to you next. What, what got you excited about RMI? And tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jules. Um, you mentioned earlier that I grew up in this very small island in the Caribbean called Dominica. And like most Caribbean islands or most islands across the world, uh, we have a lot of issues that we deal with when it comes to energy. For example, high electricity prices, oftentimes a very low reliability when it comes to electricity, uh, and a very high dependence on fossil fuels despite the abundance of 
renewable energy resources that exist um, in these islands. And growing up, these are experiences that I had to deal with every single day. These are experiences my family dealt with every single day. So that really inspired me to uh, want to find solutions uh, that will help to uh, focus uh, Ireland to better on the energy transition. Um, and similar to Lauren, uh, I had a very big passion to uh, pursue my education, um, my education in that field. Uh, so I focused on um, energy engineering and, manage and environmental management. Uh, and uh, while there, I uh, encountered uh, someone who told me about RMI uh, and the work that, that RMI does um, on islands. And that really opened up my eyes to how uh, RMI pretty much goes about uh, carrying out uh, energy transition work by working with stakeholders from the government, from utilities, from the regulator. Uh, and I was really, really inspired by that. Uh, I had the opportunity to pursue an internship with RMI three years ago uh, and joined on full time two years ago. And since then, um, I've become um, even more engrossed and fascinated um, in our work carrying out the transition um, on islands. Right now and for the past year, um, I've been focused on uh, working with stakeholders from the government, utility and regulator in Belize to help develop a long-term energy plan for the country that helps to uh, present the best or the most optimal energy solutions in the long term um, for the country while balancing the priorities um, of stakeholders of the country overall, such as economic development, um, having the resource resources, ensuring that there's environmental sustainability and uh, high reliability on your network. Uh, so it's been a pretty exciting year so far. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney. That is an inspiring story. Uh, Ryan, what brought you to RMI? And, and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Jules. Um, I think my interest in RMI was was mostly twofold. I think the first uh, was driven by the mission that, that you noted early in your presentation uh, to transform global energy usage for secure, prosperous, clean, uh, zero carbon future. And that unique mission, I think, was was what really initially drew me to RMI that uh, I think is, is unique to RMI and that you can't find in a lot of other energy organizations uh, these days. So I think the mission was the first thing that drew me to RMI. And, and the second was the work. So at the time, I was a graduate student at the University of Dayton, and, and my research was really focused on how to, uh, through techno-economic analyses, help transform that campus to a fully electric and renewably powered system. So a, a lot of my work was in kind of holistic thinking at the local level uh, and at the urban transformation position that I've uh, that I applied for and have been with in the last two years has similarly focused on local actors. So uh, with 70% of global emissions within cities, within the urban environment, how can we uh, fully transform those energy systems in those cities from fossil fuel based systems to, to clean and, and renewably powered systems. Um, so that that second part of, of the work was right up my alley. So I was really interested in, in joining the urban transformation team and helping uh, local governments be the change, uh, the change models at the local level. Um, and some of the work that that has been looking like over the last year or two has been mostly focused on renewable energy procurement in the United States over the last year. Uh, year or two. Um, and that's also been twofold. So half of our work has really been focused on some of the, the first movers. So cities like the city of Cincinnati that you mentioned earlier, uh, and that techno economic uh, financial tool that I had developed to help them procure the largest uh, 100 megawatt solar municipal farm in, in, the, in the US. So helping uh, big actors and ambitious cities like Cincinnati. So one on one support for those cities. And then the other half of our work has really been focused on our city cohort model. So uh, bringing together a large group of say 20 or 25 cities that are all looking to do the same type of project and helping them implement that project over the course of a couple of months with virtual workshops and, and peer learning. Um, and an example of that is our current work helping about 20 cities, uh, pretty diverse as well across five time zones in, in 15 different states, helping them really bring the benefits of dis distributed rooftop residential solar to marginalized communities in their area. So 
uh, really centering equity in that cohort to not just make sure that uh, the transition doesn't harm marginalized communities, but actually putting them at, at the center and at the core. So that's been uh, a project that I've really been focusing on over the last couple of months and excited about. Super, Ryan. Uh, questions are already pouring in, and so I'm going to rumble a little bit and 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 throw you guys some curveballs by by following up on some of the com the, the questions that are coming. One question I just saw uh, is um, how do we think about um, CCAs? Are community choice aggregation platforms a mechanism to do more of that procurement? Ryan and, and Lauren, you guys undoubtedly have opinions on that. Yeah, I can I can uh, start and definitely defer to Lauren after as well. Um, but yeah, I think for, for any city, it's important to look at all of the solutions that are necessary to achieve their goals. And for, uh, for a lot of cities right now, that's just municipal operations, how to get to 100% renewable energy for municipal operations. But when you really start thinking community-wide, how do you get to 100% community-wide? Uh, CCAs are definitely a solution to look at and, and look at the economics of that and, and the, um, also the, the logistical and, and kind of political barriers there as well. Um, but definitely a strategy that I think is worthwhile and one to pursue if cities are really going to achieve their community-wide 100% renewable energy goals. Uh, we haven't specifically had a cohort, a city cohort yet on that topic, but it is something that that we've uh, been thinking about. So maybe stay tuned. Lauren, any further thoughts on that? Or otherwise, I have another question for you. Yeah, I'll just add, we, we keep seeing the momentum for CCAs grow and, and they're really interesting opportunity to really integrate local considerations um, from usually multiple cities at a time into what the future energy mix looks like. So as Ryan said, I think one really interesting and promising tool in a kind of toolbox of options that are on the table for cities to think about achieving their uh, community-wide goals and, and kind of provide the renewable energy choice to um, the people within their city. Yeah. Uh, Sydney, for you, a question that is a little bit different, and that is, uh, what can we do to help Puerto Rico? And uh, I know that you were not a Puerto Rico team, but your bigger team, your colleagues have been working there. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, the work we've done in Puerto Rico, also from the perspective of coming into situations after the hurricanes have hit and seeing the pain and suffering in your home country, but also elsewhere in, in the region? Yeah, very good question, Jules. Um, and I think just broadly, uh, are my islands, so we're involved in three main things. The first one is um, integrated energy planning and ensuring that uh, we're able to develop long-term energy solutions with stakeholders. The second is project implementation and support. So we uh, work with stakeholders on the ground uh, to advance uh, distributed energy resource solutions that are beneficial to all uh, people uh, in the countries that we work in. And the third one is um, capacity building, knowledge exchange, and energy leadership. So ensuring that we really capture the lessons learned um, in our activities, and then we're able to figure out how best we scale uh, our work to other geographies. So in Puerto Rico, um, we're involved in, in some measure um, in all three activities. Um, I would say that uh, probably most prominently, uh, we're really working on the ground with a lot of uh, local stakeholders to drive uh, resilient energy solutions across the country, especially after Hurricane Maria uh, hit the island in 2017. Uh, so I think in the last uh, couple of years, we've been involved in a school microgrid project uh, focusing on building resilient solar and storage solutions on 10 schools in um, some of the mountainous regions in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that has really helped uh, to um, enhance the resilience um, of these locations, uh, particularly when you have uh, storms or any other types of disasters. So they are able to pretty much keep themselves online and uh, by for, for in, 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 in a method to pretty much be used as a, a critical service uh, to ensure that uh, whenever they need to, 
uh, help out to, uh, to find the communities with particular things, uh, then that is done uh, adequately. So that is uh, one way we've been very, very deeply involved um, in the country. Um, uh, we're also involved uh, oftentimes with the planning processes in Puerto Rico, so working with uh, some of the legislators and um, people, stakeholders on the ground, stakeholders from community groups, to ensure that uh, the energy plan in Puerto Rico uh, is done as collaboratively and to the benefit of all um, Puerto Ricans. So those are, that, those are just a couple of ways that we're very, very deeply involved and we will continue um, being involved um, in Puerto Rico as we advance um, the, um, our solutions on the island. Um, and you mentioned um, my home country, Dominica, very similarly, we did get hit by Hurricane Maria in 2017. Uh, the damage overall was immense, I think amounting to 225% of the country's GDP. Uh, and um, since that time, um, I mean, we've been very much focused on um, renewable energy uh, and driving uh, solutions which helps to reduce um, the cost of electricity and improve reliability. RMI isn't necessarily deeply involved in Dominica, um, but uh, at least it's very encouraging to see uh, solutions focused on geothermal energy and solar and so on really being developed to help uh, enhance uh, the, the overall resilient energy solutions um, in the country. Thank you, Sydney. That's very uh, good insights. And it puts the work that we do in that very personal and, and individual context of the, the impact of the hurricanes, of course. Um, Ryan, uh, from your perspective, um, what is the, the scaling vector to take the work that you're doing with an individual city to scale across the country and maybe even beyond the US, right? Because uh, it's incredibly exciting to see that your tool helped the city of Cincinnati, but there's a hell of a lot of cities. How do we go from one to multiple to all? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a, a question that a lot of teams at RMI are grappling with is how do we achieve scale? And I think there's there's a, a few uh, tools in our in our tool set to do that. I think one is this cohort model of of uh, not just working with one-off cities, but really gathering a lot of cities together in one process and learning from not, not just RMI, but each other and using their experiences of implementing that project in the past and, and spreading that knowledge to others. So I think scaling up that, that co city cohort model, um, not just in the US, but abroad in, in other countries like China and India as well, I think is, is kind of that one of our scaling mechanisms that we're really interested in uh, and I think another is is actually uh, really making a lot of the the tools and resources that we develop um, broadly applicable. So that tool that we initially focused just on the city of Cincinnati, you know, built this Excel model to determine what the uh, econ uh, economics of an offsite solar farm would look like in their situation, but then modified that so that any city in the U.S. could use that tool and, and look at the an offsite deal for them as well. Um, so providing the necessary tools and resources and know-how to any city that wants to, to implement a project uh, across the board, whether that's uh, renewable energy or, or otherwise. So I think um, those, are, those are two examples. I think there's definitely a, a few others, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. Well, let me build on that because you hinted already at this ability to provide people to learn with mechanisms to learn from each other and provide them with tools. And Sydney, you guys have done similar work in the Caribbean with the community of practice. Can you talk about that, those mechanisms to scale beyond the work you're doing on individual island countries? Yes, very good point, Jules. Um, with our, my islands uh, for at least five years now, um, we've been, uh, well, as part of our energy leadership work, we developed a community of practice uh, that Brian was actually involved in quite a bit. Um, but with that community of practice, uh, what uh, we essentially formed, we worked with a regional partner in the Caribbean called Carilex, that is the Caribbean Utility Services Company. And we created uh, an online platform called CARIC, which stands for the Carilex Renewable Energy Community. And what that platform did uh, we were is that we were able to bring in members from all across the world who are interested in energy, in the energy transition, 
and we're able to share a lot of resources related to energy. We enable in a lot of interaction between stakeholders from different countries where oftentimes we may not be able to uh, engage with each other or know what is actually going on in other countries. So we really uh, help to enable that. We help to organize uh, a lot of webinars based on the interests of the members um, in that community uh, and uh, ensure that there's, there's adequate resources uh, available um, on the CARIC platform uh, to ensure that uh, that learning from our work as well as uh, work from uh, some of our other partners in um, the region were really disseminated across to as wide a group as possible. So um, that's just some of the work that we've been doing and obviously we'll be continuing to scale this work even further um, uh, with the Energy um, Transition Academy. Super, thank you, Sydney. Lauren, from your perspective, the electricity practice has been looking for ways to scale and grow already for a long time. And ELAP is certainly one mechanism where you put lots of new ideas out in the field. Can you talk about the scaling mechanisms in the work that you and your electricity colleagues do? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. So I, I think that um, I really like to think about it in terms of the full strategy, right? The think, do, and scale piece of our work. And the scale part to me looks like a couple of different things. First, as you mentioned, our electricity innovation lab, we have such a track record now in the electricity space in the US of bringing together utilities, bringing together regulators and um, communities and other on the ground stakeholders that um, can, creatively collaborate and co-develop solutions to the electricity transition. And we've seen that be a really powerful change model in not only coming up with new and creative ideas, but really building the relationships that are gonna be the foundation of the transition moving forward. Um, we are really excited to continue to scale that work and focus on, similar to Sydney's work in the island, really building out more communities of practice around our electricity innovation lab as well. So building a community of regulators that can support each other in understanding what the um, what the regulatory constructs that support deep decarbonization look like and, and same for utilities and other stakeholders in the transition. We also are really excited about scaling through our research and analysis. I think one of the things that's been really exciting to me is seeing um, some of the stickiness of, of the concepts that we've explored analytically in our team. So this idea of clean energy portfolios as a cost effective alternative to building new gas um, has been really sticky and pervasive across the electricity space. And, I'm really excited about the potential to scale that narrative globally and, and think about what is a clean energy portfolio look like that displaces the need for new fossil in China, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and how we can continue to scale the ideas as well as um, the community. Thank you, Lauren. That is, that is a perfect segue to some of the questions that I already see coming in. I mean, Folks, we're not going to be able to answer them all because there's so many good and interesting questions. But let me try to pick out some, some themes that are emerging, even if it's not the individual question. So a lot of questions around this balancing of the electricity system and the role of gas as a transition fuel versus the role of high voltage DC as a way of balancing power grids versus the role of hydrogen and storing hydrogen for balancing the grid versus the role of the transactive market design as a mechanism to balance grids. And Sydney, Lauren, this plays out in the work that you guys do in two very different settings, but it plays out on islands and it plays out in countries. Who wants to jump in first to, to sort of give the perspective that we are bringing to bear on this, on this whole set of questions? I'm happy to jump in first, Jules. Um, yeah, it is a true balancing act uh, overall, but at our mind across a lot of our programs, I think we have a very methodological and inclusive approach to figure out how best we go about deciding um, what is best. Um, early on, I talked about um, inclusive energy planning as one of the major activities that we conduct uh, in the islands program. And what that involves is that we are able to bring together stakeholders from the government, from the utility, 
from the, the regulatory agencies and the general public who oftentimes have this different, sometimes similar, but sometimes different and conflicting priorities. And we do our best to try to help to align everyone to have a joint set of priorities in terms of where they want the energy system to go in the future. Uh, we integrate that with our techno-economic approach, which is um, very fact-based uh, and completely unbiased. So we ensure that we uh, bring together information on adequate resources based on the needs of the stakeholders. And obviously, stakeholders have different priorities and needs depending on where you are. Uh, but we do our best to work with these, these stakeholders uh, to bring in a lot of technical economic analysis to ensure that uh, we are able to put everything on the table and then uh, can compare all of the options uh, uh, against the priorities of, of those stakeholders to best decide what the most optimal uh, solutions are. So that is just an insight into uh, what we are able to do with a lot of stakeholders in Ireland. And I know we're constantly doing that across other programs at RMI and maybe Lauren can um, touch on some of that. Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Jules and Sydney. Um, yeah, a lot of parallels to our work on the kind of global electricity side. But uh, one thing that's been kind of unexpectedly challenging this year is really understanding how we can transition away from gas in the next decade and retire the existing gas on the system. So what we're seeing is actually this debate playing out in real time. You saw in California some of the challenges of, of the timeline alignment, right? So retiring new gas, but there's a strong need to replace it quickly with enough renewable generation to provide the reliability that we need. Um, and that's really pointed us towards thinking about what the alternatives we're going to need in, in the middle or latter half of the decade that are going to provide the reliability that we need in terms of uh, sufficient generation for days when there isn't enough wind and solar alone for potentially long periods of time. So what's exciting for me is that now we kind of have a we have a very clear roadmap, I think, as a result of this strategy exercise that about what needs to happen. And, and one of the things that needs to happen is we need to find ways to mature a lot of the carbon-free technologies that can meet that reliability need toward the end of the decade. So um, we need to start deploying them now where they do make economic sense. So uh, things like replacing a stub station or building a really expensive transmission line provide a really cost-effective test bed for large format energy storage, for example. Um, and by starting to deploy those in the places they make sense now, we can have a really robust carbon-free electricity solution set by the end of the decade, which is when we'll need it. Thank you. And, and very importantly, we are, as part of that work, also blocking out new natural gas. And as you pointed out earlier, that is really critical because I saw in the, the question box, can you talk about natural gas as a transition fuel or can you talk about natural gas as a low carbon solution and the reality is no you can't natural gas emits co2 and uh, we cannot afford to use natural gas at scale um, over time either in power generation or in our built environment and uh, it is absolutely critical that we make it clear to utilities around the world and city administrations and state governments and nations that natural gas is no longer a pathway to anywhere. It's basically a dead end street. And I saw a number of questions and I'm going to rattle through a couple of uh, answers quickly in order to get some things out of the way before we then um, uh, come back to the panel. And I heard questions about population control. I heard questions about nature-based solutions and is RMI doing work on that? Is RMI doing work on negative emission solutions? And the answer is uh, there are fortunately incredibly good organizations in the world that work on these areas, but uh, RMI has decided that its focus is on the energy transition and that we really become the experts and the specialists in that area. And we team up with others, we work closely with others, um, but uh, we don't have to do everything ourselves. And that's okay, because we have great allies and, and 
uh, fellow uh, civil society organizations that work in these other areas. I did see a question on environmental justice and somebody said, well, you don't know about the environmental justice movement. Well, we are actually quite aware of them. We work intensively together in a number of our programs. We also have helped create a setting in which the leaders of different parts of the climate movement can get together and work together, whether that is the Sunrise Movement and 350.org and Greenpeace, or the people who do on-the-ground work in developing countries, or the work that we did in the state of New York with local community-based organizations that are looking for the low-carbon solutions uh, for their communities. We connect with them, but we don't necessarily have to do everything ourselves. I had an important question from a number of you about the implications of the new administration and what is RMI going to do with them? Well, uh, we are, of course, um, excited about the ambitions that have been expressed by the incoming administration to accelerate the energy transition and address climate change. And uh, at RMI, we happen to have a number of people who have previously served in the federal government and who are therefore closely connected to the incoming administration and we've been providing them with ideas and with insights we've been writing papers we've been making suggestions for ideas and some of our people have taken some time off to serve on transition teams so definitely we are connecting we are looking forward to working with the biden administration and specifically also with um, uh, secretary uh, john kerry uh, who has been appointed to this incredibly important role of global climate envoy. Uh, Biden has already announced that he will join the Paris Agreement again. And that's exciting news, but it's not enough. The good news is over the last four years, our work with We Are Still In and uh, America's Pledge has shown that the work of cities and the works of states and the work of businesses and financial institutions already starts to amount to significant progress on um, mission re emission reductions uh, here in the United States. And now we have the federal government back in the game, uh, so that will further accelerate. Uh, but just joining the Paris Agreement alone is not good enough. We need to move from those international negotiations to action planning, to implementation, to making things happen. And for that, we also see an important role for the new administration, but also for RMI to work with the global industries, with financial institutions around the world uh, to make this transition happen. And one of you asked, what is the most important thing that financial institutions can do? And there's really two parts to that. Financial institutions can, of course, help drive some of the innovations, invest in the solutions of the future, help to, uh, uh, create the new businesses, finance the new businesses uh, that we need for this transition. But financial institutions also need to deal with their existing portfolio. One of the things that our Center for Climate Aligned Finance is doing is it's working with some of the largest financial institutions in the world to analyze what is sitting in their current portfolio of loans and their current portfolio of investments and what do they need to do um, in order to make that transition uh, happen uh, so that they also become Paris aligned. So that is an important ingredient as well. Um, and the last question that I'll quickly take off is, what are we doing in India? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to make it slightly broader and, and, say, and talk about what we're doing in India and what we're doing in China, because in some ways it's a little bit similar. Much of our work here in the United States, as I mentioned, is at the city level, is with businesses, is with the energy companies, um, also with states, some with the net federal government. In China and in India, uh, we have been welcomed by and we work more closely also with the national government, both in China and in India. Um, the national governments have embraced the work that we do, have um, sought out our help. Uh, and in both instances, we feel that some of our most impactful things that we can do is to work with the governments of those countries uh, to help chart a course, a path for decarbonization. Just like uh, Sydney was describing, he's doing as part of his multi-stakeholder work on islands where governments are an important stakeholder as well. And in the case of India, it is particularly around a new technology 
for much more energy efficient room air conditioning, which we hope will drive down dramatically the increase in electricity necessary for a country like India, where more people are coming into the middle class, where the temperature is rising, and where we need to help find more energy efficient air conditioning solutions, but also the work in India about electric mobility. Now you might say, huh? India, electric mobility, but actually the country has demonstrated itself to be a real leader in adopting some of these new technologies. They've done that with LED light bulbs, they've done that with photovoltaics, and now they're doing this electric mobility, particularly for the two-wheelers and the three-wheelers and the minibuses uh, that are so prevalent in Indian uh, mobility landscape. And so the Indian government just announced with our help a two and a half billion dollar stimulus program to build out the domestic battery manufacturer so that a local electric car industry can emerge, particularly focused on those two wheelers, three wheelers and minibuses. And then finally, we've been asked by the government to also help start thinking through how in each state, the electric com um, company, the distribution company can start to um, deal with these issues of high penetration renewables and more intermittency as they add more and more solar, particularly in India, solar to their network and how are they going to create the, the, the structures and the mechanisms by which to deal with that intermittency. So lots of exciting work going on both in China and in India. I'd like to uh, go back to the panel and ask each of you three for a moment uh, to speak a little bit from your heart. Yes, we do our work because climate change is important to us, but we do this work also because it is about people and it is about the impact that uh, climate has on people. And, and for all of us at RMI, uh, building that sustainable future is a, is a big inspiration. So talk to us um, for a moment about what this means for you personally to think about the elements of climate justice and uh, environmental sustainability. And Sydney, can I pick on you to go first again? Yeah, happy to. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, just the whole idea of energy equity, uh, environmental justice, those are things that uh, I have been thinking about. Those are things that as our team, um, we have been thinking about um, quite a lot. Uh, and with the impact of climate change in islands, like really hitting uh, them very very hard um like for me like the entire uh, like issue is very personal um i mean i'm coming from the caribbean living there i mean you want to be able to help to ensure like a more prosperous future uh, for yourself for your family for those who are um around you um and uh, really being able to help to contribute towards um solutions focused on the energy transition that uh, adequately incorporate uh, energy equity and environmental justice. Those are things that I know will benefit me and those around me greatly, uh, as particularly in um, years to come. And um, as you mentioned earlier, hopefully we will be able to limit uh, the overall um, effect of uh, climate change and the temperature degree rise. Um, and hopefully because of that, then to uh, limit the impact of extreme events, uh, which often cause a lot of um, destruction in islands. Um, I mean, personally, I've gone through at least three hurricanes in my lifetime and just hearing a lot of the harrowing stories um, after Hurricane Three, which I did not experience personally, but being on the ground, seeing the change that people needed to go through, uh, how they had to rebuild their life, uh, much less for their possessions and the infrastructure. Um, that, that you really saw how it affected people, but looking at 2020 right now, you got to see how everyone is able to build back up, to build back better, and to become more resilient um, to uh, the, um, the, what, whatever affected them. So seeing that and see and ensuring that uh, that in the future we will become even more resilient um, is a lot of what drives me personally because I see the effects around me every single day. Thank you, Sydney. That uh, that is really personal and comes from the heart. Wonderful, Ryan. How about you? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's a really important question uh, for all of us at RMI to ask: is how can we center equity in our work and 
Uh, I think in our in the urban transformation program, one of the main ways that we've been doing that is in the city cohorts, uh, especially in this in this current effort to make sure that uh, in these inclusive solarized campaigns that that the local governments are running to expand rooftop residential solar access, um, that they're partnering with frontline community-based organizations in their community, and that they're they secure those partnerships from the start, so that the decision making uh, so that they're involved in the decision making from the start and partnering with the right financial institutions. And I think another role to add on uh, to your point on the role financial institutions can play is to enable uh, affordable and accessible financing to LMI residents um, that don't qualify for the typical 650 FICO score or don't uh, or where the interest rate is, is, is too high to make solar pan out and, and be cost effective. So making sure that local governments are partnering with the right community-based and financial uh, organizations to make sure that their work is really inclusive and enables participation from the marginalized communities in urban environments. Um, because even, as I said before, 70% of emissions are in the urban environment. Uh, the majority of inequities are also in the urban environment due to a long history of systemic racism. So I think making sure that we address that in the in our work and making sure that we enable participation for marginalized members uh, to see the benefits of this clean energy transition uh, is super important and an exciting exciting opportunity that our RMI has. Super, thank you, Ryan. And is your PPA calculator online available? Asks Vika Shrechta. Uh, yeah, so all of the tools and resources our team has developed are on our. Uh, individual kind of sub website of our my city renewables.org and all of the the tools and resources our team has developed are on there city renewables.org because lauren climate justice and the personal dimension for you yeah i mean for me i'm i'm from california my state is on fire and projections are saying that it will continue to be on fire for a long time unless we do something pretty drastic over the next decade. Um, but really what's stuck with me most is uh, my work in our electricity innovation lab convening community stakeholders and environmental justice stakeholders over the past several years. I've worked with stakeholders in North Minneapolis and Northern Manhattan who are, who are trying to provide really basic services to their communities, specifically energy resilience and in times of need and disaster. Um, that the energy transition can really support if we um, make sure that we're listening to those priorities. Um, and talking to stakeholders who uh, spend every day going door to door, signing up folks in their communities for their utility programs that can help them save money. Um, it's just been really inspiring to hear about all the work that's going on. And for me personally, I just feel it's really critical if we're gonna build something better um, and we're going to do it over the next decade that in order for it to stick and to last, we, we need to be incorporating those voices at the center of the transition and understanding what's going to work for, what's going to work for everybody. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And um, uh, folks, uh, I wish we had more time. There have been a number of great questions that we haven't been able to answer. So apologies for that. Please feel free to reach out to us through our website if there are very specific proposals or questions to any of the team members or the work that we're doing. And we also appreciate everybody's time and attention today because this is so important for all of us and uh, engaging with you on our work leaves us informed and inspired. As a nonprofit organization, all of our work is made possible by the support of the community around us, our donors. So if you like what you've heard today, and if you want to play a role in helping to create a clean, prosperous and secure low carbon future, please consider a gift to RMI at rmi.org slash donate. During this critical time, we have a very special challenge, a decisive decade challenge uh, by one of our donors uh, who has kindly agreed to match for the next 48 hours only all new and increased gifts by 100%. So please, if you are able to, if you're willing to consider making a gift to RMI at rmi.org slash donate over the next 48 hours.
We thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again in the future and working with you in addressing the energy and climate challenge. Thank you very much for being with us today. Bye-bye.